Good afternoon. Um, I've had enough, uh, enough inquiries on the same sort of question being asked by various media that I finally decided to relent, get off my stumps, as we say, and lead you step by step through my methods of making an entire kilt from beginning to finish. Now, because I'm shooting this out of sequence, <clears throat> I'm introducing it from what is probably going to be the third or the fourth episode, where we've had the initial meeting with the clients. We've determined how he wants it pleated. Uh, we've measured them, and now we're going to translate those measurements to the cloth. So we order the cloth sometime later. Right now it's about 27 weeks from time of order, or confirmation of order to delivery. I unroll the cloth. I make sure, and I'm never, I'm, you know, I've never been shorted, but I make sure that I've got um, what I've ordered. And usually if I order 7.4 meters, which is 8 yards in old money, I'll get... A little bit over. I'll get six or eight inches over. They always give me long, a long measure. So I unroll the cloth. I, um, I'll i often unroll it well before I'm going to start working on it because I want it to relax a little bit because it'll, it'll have creases from folds in it. And then I determine which side, which edge is the better edge, right? They, they're both a kilting selvage, but one is the finished edge and it's not completely straight. You can see it's kind of you can see that it's a bit wavy there with the color transitions. And I've noticed that on the very busy tartans with great many color variation, it, it can be quite bumpy. But this is still the better edge because the second edge, we can see there's little nubbins from where the, the bobbin is reversed. Now, um, somewhere on the cloth, as we get it from Dalgleish, they'll stick a this little peel on peel off sticker that just says face which tells us that this is the the outside the good face of the cloth and they'll usually but only usually put it near the good edge but so always never completely trust this if you see the face sticker as the cloth is facing you pun intended the grain will be from high left to low right from 11 o'clock to five o'clock on, on an analog clock face but sometimes this will be on the wrong edge. So double check your edge. I have a friend who made that, uh, that error once and he's not done it again. So having done that, now in my earlier video, I showed you how to use my method of, mem my method of membership. And somebody had asked, a couple of people had asked, how do we divide it and how do we apply those measurements to the cloth? In addition to natural waist, hip, fell, and full length from natural waist to the top of the knee, I've decided recently, a bit of a cheat, it's not, not a treat, it's a cheat, it's just a labor-saving device. While I'm measuring somebody, I'll also slap the tape on them to see where the logical place is to my eye for the width of the apron. Now remember, we don't want it narrower. There's the points in my pelvis, a little harder to find than years previously. Thank you, beer. Um, we don't want it much, we don't want it more narrow than the horns of the pelvis because that's tartan skirt country. My background as a military kilt maker is that the apron is wider than the, the pleated section of the kilt. But a good place to start is, you know, 50-50, where the apron... Now, this fellow's waist is 46, and his hip is 48. So you could start at 23 apron, 23 pleats. But he was standing there, I threw the tape on him, and I decided that an extra inch, 24, was actually a better measurement given his physique. Having also taken the pit, taken his measurements, I'll take a picture of him, shirt and trousers, shirt tucked into the trousers, taken from the front, the rear, and the side, so that I can refer to that when I'm sewing here, because the numbers aren't enough. I also need to remember his posture and his physique. So having done that, I unroll the cloth. I've quickly, 24 inches, I quickly just put the tape down, because he's decided he wants it, to the black stripe on green. So the center of my apron is going to be the black stripe on green. <clears throat> so I just slap it down because what I'm looking for is I want to make sure I can't put it here, even though that's 24 inches, because at the from the edge, outside edge of the apron, I want at least a full hand span. And for me, that's almost that's eight and a half inches. Because remember, we have to fold that and we have to put in the uh, the fringe. Also, this edge is cut rather than ripped. So we're going to have to rip that off, but that'll happen a little bit later. So I found the center point of the front apron. Again, I'm just measuring it far enough in from the side. My first, now I've determined that this is my center. 
so I do a, a, a yellow cross. And my own personal habit, and this is not by ironclad, but I need to rule. I always start for my external marks, I start with a new sharp piece of chalk. I use white to indicate a place where I'm cutting or ripping. I use yellow to indicate a measurement point. So starting off, my first measurement is from the bottom edge of the kilt, measuring up. Now his measurement is 25 inches. Now the 25 comes just an eighth of an inch short of the edge of this black line. So I'm just going to adjust up to that black line because that eighth won't make a difference. And, we're, and it just makes it a little bit easier to, to mark too. My second measurement is fell as eight. So now I mark down from the top of the kilt, eight inches. And once again, that puts it just a little bit short of that transition between blue and black. So rather than mark it, rather than measure it for each one of the pleats, I'm just gonna extend it down a little bit. If it's more than a half inch, you probably don't wanna do that, but that's about half inch and that's within allowable tolerances. The third measurement is the waist 24. So half 24 is 12. I mark, so here's the top edge of the kilt. I mark it either side. I mark down two and a half inches and I've yet to think this through why this seems to be the invariable or the constant measurement. I've, I sort of hit upon it empirically decades ago, can't completely understand why it is. So therefore I'll see if I can come to an explanation, but it's always worked for me, except in a very, very minor few cases. And I'll show you how to adapt for that when we get to it. So length fell, I guess the third measurement would be two and a half down and make a mark. Fourth measurement, a little bit, contradict myself a little bit there. The 24 inches of the waist measurement at the top of the kilt, measure it again at, because this mark two and a half inches down, that's the center of the strap and the buckle. Mark that again. And then the last measurement of the front apron down to the bottom of the fell is 25 inches. Great. And now, I go to the other end of the cloth and I do the whole thing again. I'm being a little bit messy and quick here. I do the whole thing again. Once again, measuring from the edge of the cloth. Because <coughs> on the inside apron, the center of the apron doesn't have to match the center of the outside apron. It can be the, the opposite as it were, because you have basically two main features here, the blue stripe here and the black stripe here. If it was convenient to do so, I would without, a, it wouldn't cause my conscience any harm to center the inner apron on the opposite feature, so to speak. But in this case, again, just there's a little bit less than a hand span. The reason why I'm going that deep is because I'm going to have to harvest a couple of inches by ripping off the end here, which is going to provide the fringe for the outer apron. So that's about right. But I decided, you know, mm, maybe there. In fact, in, in um, consideration of the next step, I just might move this over one so that it is centered. In fact, I'm going to do that now. Thinking as I go. Okay, that's, there's my new center. And because I've already marked from the tape, I can make those marks with confidence. So hip is 25, so that's 12 and a half. Okay. Waist is 24, so that's 12. And I realize I'm using the dull piece of chalk as I do this, but eh, it doesn't matter for this. And 24. Good. That, now I'm just going to put a diagonal line because this wax chalk, and it's a good idea if you're not using Dalglish cloth, it's a good idea, if, in any case, whatever chalk you find, it's a good idea to do a sample mark on your cloth on a, on a place that will never be seen in the finished kilt and then touch a hot iron to it because the iron should make that absolutely vanish, right? Sometimes it doesn't. Well, that's a good idea to take, to take care in that regard. Okay, so I've crossed out the lines that no longer apply. That's my new center of the inside apron, which gives me a 
that full hand span to be the edge, the folded over edge of the apron. Because this fellow's a, he's, he has, he's a gentleman of full habit. And we have to consider because we want to build a kilt so that it will be alterable in the future, no matter what his figure does, whether it, it increases or decreases. So that gives me, I'm not, I don't have to compromise with the amount of cloth on the edge of his inner apron, but it still gives me that material that I need for the fringe. Okay, so having done that, I now determine how deep to have the inner apron. Now, right now, I'm going to go to the old marks for a reason that, I'll, that you'll see why shortly. Because he's pleading it to the stripe. I, okay, I just went two repeats of the pattern. And the, one of the key characteristics of my kilts is a, quite a deep apron pleat on both sides. Usually, ideally, a quarter to a third of the total width of the kilt. This is, I'd call it a fat third. It's about as deep as I want to make it, but the cloth is also telling me where, where it needs to go. Now this first, where I just brought the kilt to, this isn't going to be a pleat, because the last pleat is going to butt up against the apron, like so, okay? So the mark I make now is just this little arrow mark, and it's just something, I, a shorthand that I came up with myself. And then I mark the next pleat. That's going to be, the, the, well, in this case, the first pleat. This is the last pleat on the kilt. I just make a little X to show where, which one is the, the last pleat. Now, I've already done this on the other end, so I won't waste your time going back and then making a mark that's already there. So my next step <coughs> is to count how many repeats of the pattern. Now, because this kilt is going to be pleated to the stripe, that complete, that finished number whatever number it will be, is that's the maximum number of pleats that are possible in this kilt. If we're pleating to the stripe, it's the maximum number of pleats that are achievable. In a separate episode, we'll talk about pleating to the set, because that's a whole different ball of wax. Okay, so there's our first pleat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Because there is the first pleat that I'd already marked by doing this, by doing the same. Right? Now again, the, the advantages of having these deep apron pleats is it means the kilt hangs better when the person the person is standing. There's a there's a it looks more elegant when the person's walking or running. And just as importantly, should this person or a subsequent owner of this kilt be somewhat more grand in his appearance, we've got to res reserve a cloth to increase the size of the apron, right? So there we are. Now, remember that? 26. I don't like even numbers of pleats because I strongly believe, I firmly maintain that if the kilt has got, you can't see them both at the same time. It's hard to see them even when it's laying on the table, but I've noticed that people still pick up on it, that if you've got the center, this black line is center on the apron, that we need a center back pleat. If we have an even number of pleats, it's gonna be off center. And I firmly maintain, I, I can spot it and it bugs me. So we had 26 pleats, so what am I gonna do? Remember what I said earlier about moving that apron over? Okay, that was my 26th pleat. That's now my fold-over spot. This is my 25th pleat, so that'll be the final pleat. Okay? I'm just going to take a second to fold it back again. Just because it really bugs me to see cloth left rumpled on the bench. And as I've said elsewhere, and will continue to say, this is this Dalglish cloth, custom woven, 16 to 18 ounce. And that, that value reflects how much a square yard of this stuff weighs. I'm not going to waste. This stuff's well over $100 a yard now. There's no way I'm going to waste it. Cut off a piece. Or given my terrible math abilities, I could calculate it, but i got better things to do. Okay, so there we are. Uh, now to calculate the pleat width. So we know 
at the waist, the pleated section has to be 22 inches. And at the hip, it has to be 23 inches. Now, in that other, a couple of other videos, I explain how to use the pre-literate counting method of fractions using a tape. And in another video, I showed you my exercise for determining pleat widths, because these remain constant. If you have 19 pleats, a half inch pleat is always going to cover nine and a half inches. And 35 pleats, it's going to be 17 and a half inches. These, these are fixed values. So although I like to do this every time, because I'm keeping an archaic custom, an archaic skill alive, at the same time, I'm also a production shop. So I'm just going to pull out my sheet and go, okay, we've got... 25 pleats. Now I need 22 at the waist. Half inch, no. Five eighths, three quarters, no. Seven eighths, if 25 pleats, each seven eighths of an inch is 21 and seven eighths, which of course is one eighth away from 22. It's there. So I consider that acceptable. Okay, so at the waist, seven eighths. But if we go up to a one inch pleat, we want 23. But we got 25. Now, sorry, two inches over, an inch, an inch or so over, I, I wouldn't mind, but two inches over is a little bit much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the value between those two. Seven eighths is 14 sixteenths. So what's 15 sixteenths? Well, 21 and seven eighths, 21 and seven eighths is there. So now I'm going to count. Sixteenths, and of course, a sixteenth is half of an eighth. So, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, two, twenty-four, twenty, back up, twenty-five. So twenty, just a little over twenty-three and three eighths, and I consider that acceptable. So what I'm going to call, I'm going to call that, sure, it's fifteen sixteenths, but I can also call that seven eighths plus. Now that'll be up all for this episode. In the next episode, I'll cover starting to mark the pleats because you'll notice that I'm doing, or at least you'll see that I'm doing all of my calculations, all of my chalking, all of my striking, as they call it, in, in suit tailoring before I actually alter the cloth. So thank you and carry on.